So <clears throat> we're going to look at the love of Christ this morning and we're going to do it from Ephesians chapter 3 and I'm sure many of you here are familiar with that wonderful letter by Paul uh, where in chapter 2 he's, he's talked about the mystery of the gospel. Very often when he uses the word mystery He's talking about this thing that, that wasn't very clear. There were glimpses of it in the Old Testament, but it certainly wasn't clear, and now it has become known. And it is this, that it's not, no longer simply the Jews who are the children of God and, and are separated by walls of hostility from the Gentiles. No, no. In Christ... Those walls of hostility are gone. And God is carrying forward his purposes to bring all things, including the Jews and the Gentiles, together again under one head, who is Christ. And he's building Jews and Gentiles together to be a place in which he will dwell by his Spirit. It's hard to imagine a greater transformation. We are still suffering the after effects of the hostility between Jews and Gentiles and between uh, Jews and particularly other nations in the Middle East. We're still suffering all of the fallout from that hostility today which Christ took away on the cross. And Paul says he was appointed a minister of this mystery to the Gentiles to tell them that they can now be included by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in this one body and have access to one God by the same Spirit as the Jews. And then he gets to this point in chapter 3 and you can imagine, given that backdrop of of centuries and centuries of hostility now gone and suddenly Jews and Gentiles thrown together I'm speaking colloquially because it's all God's plan but suddenly there they are they're sitting next to each other in church and you can imagine humanly speaking how that might have felt and there are all kinds of things in that situation that Paul could have prayed for this church and I'm sure there were lots of things that he did pray for them that we don't have written down but this is what he wrote to them because he wanted them to know he was praying this for them and it's Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 14 through 21 for this reason because of the breaking down of the of the barriers because this mystery has now been revealed and because I'm a minister of that mystery to the Gentiles for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever. Amen. So as a very short back-of-the-envelope summary of what he's saying, he's saying, 
I want Christ to dwell in you and to lay a foundation there of love. And then I want you to build on that foundation to the point where you're going to be able to comprehend the dimensions of this mind-blowing love and you're going to know this love which is beyond our ability to know. Because then you may be filled to all the fullness of God. I hope you'll notice that he's not saying, I want you to be able to pass a test on the love of God and it's going to be multiple choice and sit down and you've got to get 90% in order to have a passing grade. This is not in that realm at all. He wants the Ephesians to gain a more intimate experience of God and Christ by means of a deeper knowledge of their love. And that can't simply be an intellectual knowledge, can it? It can't just be a matter of stashing lots of facts in our minds. It's got to go beyond that. It's experience, an experience that is key to being filled with all the fullness of God. I am assuming, I might have a show of hands, but I think I know the result. How many people here, I'm not going to put my hand up, feel like they are currently filled to all the fullness of God? You can put your hand up if you want to. But I'll probably talk to you afterwards if you do. That's not where we are, is it? That's not our experience. But it's possible. Paul wouldn't be praying this for them if it was impossible. And he knows it's an amazing thing. And he says, but God can do more than we can ask or imagine. So that's what I'm asking for you, you Ephesians. Now, isn't it important for us, if we're not in that place, if we could make some progress in that experience, uh, to be filled up with all the fullness of God, isn't that something that's worth spending some time on this morning? How are the Jews going to bury centuries of enmity and hostility with, with the Gentiles? How are they going to live out a witness to the power of God in the gospel? Now that all that divided them once is gone and they're both joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are they going to grit their teeth and say, well, it says so here and those are the facts, so I suppose we better just suck it up and get on with it. Is that going to work? You couldn't measure in milliseconds how long that would work for. They had to have this love of Christ filling them. They had to be filled up to all the fullness of God and overflowing with love. Well, how is this fellowship going to live out a witness to the power of the gospel? It's the same thing. We need to be immersed in Christ's love as an experience. That's what eternal life is. And I know we're good reformed folk and, and you, you'll laugh at this because you always do, which is very kind of you. I'm a British good reformed person with the stiff upper lip and, and all the credentials intact. And we get a bit uncomfortable, don't we, when we start talking about experience because it's outside the box and the box for us is the doctrines of grace that we love and we can check the box on the five points of Calvinism and we feel comfortable with that because we can get our minds around it somewhat although the doctrines themselves are incredible but now we're talking about a relationship about being filled up to all the fullness of God and we start to feel a little bit uncomfortable. But that's what Paul is saying here. 
This is open to us if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us just to dwell on three things this morning to help us to go a little bit further in this subject. The first is this. Christ's love has dimensions. The second is, as we already know, Christ's love surpasses knowledge. And then lastly, Christ's infinite love may be experienced. So first then, Christ's love has dimensions. Uh, in Ephesians 3.19, you'll see uh, Paul uses these words, which we've said a few times already, that, that the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. The, I'm going to suggest that that's a little bit lame. Our English language sometimes plays things down. I'm not a Greek scholar, and I could be wrong here, but the word surpasses talks about going beyond to an extraordinary degree. It's far, far beyond what is normal or a point on a scale that you might set. This is just out of sight. And we bring it down into one word and we say, well, it surpasses. Okay, well, I, I think this is a word we can get a bit excited about. Concerning the love of Christ, it goes far beyond this thing that is translated here as knowledge. That is just, if you like, the content of what could be known. If you can put together everything that can be perceived of the love of Christ, everything that you can discover about it, and everything that you can learn about it, so we're all in the, in the realm of, of what we can accomplish with our minds, if you can put together the sum total of the knowledge, then the love of Christ goes so far beyond that. It's amazing. So now I've got a problem, haven't I? And I faced this problem probably on about Thursday night. I thought, how am I going to preach on something that is an experience that is far beyond anything that we can know? Where do you even begin? And I thought, well, I could show some pictures of my last vacation um, or something like that. But then I thought, you know, the very best way to do this, if, if the love of Christ goes beyond what we can know, then let's start with what we can know. That can't be a bad thing to do, can it? And, and then I thought, and where is the place in Scripture where the love of Christ and the love of God is on display more than anywhere else? It's the cross, isn't it? So now I'm starting to think, okay, we can, we can certainly learn a lot about the love of Christ at the cross. And then Paul comes in with this very interesting idea of dimensions. He says in Ephesians 3.18 that the, the Christians may be able to comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the, of the love of Christ. That love which uh, Paul in Romans 5 verse 8 tells us, God has demonstrated. He demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus himself says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So we have this love that Paul says has got height and depth and length and breadth. And it's demonstrated supremely at the cross. So let's reflect on the cross. Let's spend a few moments thinking about these dimensions in relation to the cross. I want to take them slightly out of the order that Paul lists them there in that verse in Ephesians and start with the height of Christ's love. Have you ever asked yourself this question, how high is Christ's love? I'm going to get out a tape measure. How long would it need to be in order to, to actually measure the height of the love of Christ? Well, it's as high as the heaven from which he descended in order 
to save us. Let's think about that descent for a moment. We sang about it last week, didn't we? Um, he left his father's throne above. So free. So infinite. His grace. Was that an easy thing? To leave the father's throne and to come down? How far was that? How much of a stoop for Jesus? And in coming down, of course, he took human nature with all of its limitations except sin. He had to learn things. Try and get your mind around that. He went from being king of kings and lord of lords with thousands and thousands of angels admiring and worshipping him and giving him glory to the man Christ Jesus, the servant who took a towel and a bowl of water and washed his disciples' feet. And then he went on to a shameful death on the cross and was counted a despised criminal. See if you can think of a higher station that he could have come from or a lower place that he could have descended to. I don't think you will. I don't think it's possible. I think that is the biggest stoop that it was possible in, in any avenue of study, in any line of thought that you care to take up. I don't think you can imagine a greater stoop than that. That was the descent. Well, think also, in, in terms of the height of his love, of the distastefulness. Because his soul was spotless. But the world he descended into is vile. Probably made him, if we can say this reverently, probably wanted to make him throw up, spiritually speaking. You know how the, the lukewarm Laodiceans, he says, I, I want to vomit you out of my mouth. What do you think it was like for the, the, the man Christ Jesus, whose soul was spotless, to live in this world. Lot, who was a sinner. His soul was tormented living in Sodom. What do you think it was like for Christ, who was sinless, to live here? To go from an eternal bliss in heaven to become the man of sorrows and one acquainted with grief. We just recently looked at him weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. And there were many reasons why he wept, but certainly in there was what sin had done to his creation. He was the one through whom all things have been made. And here is death. Death of one that he loved. That's what sin had done to his creation. And he wept and he was exposed to it through his descent in a different way. See him take a whip and drive the profiteers out of the temple. This house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations and you're making it a den of robbers. Get out. What a stoop to come into a world like this, to endure temptations just like we do, but without sin. And he even had to put up with his own creature, Satan, mocking, tempting him. So the question is, in terms of that descent, in terms of, of the distance, if you like, of heaven to earth, in terms of the distastefulness from purity and bliss to manner of sorrows. Why? Why did he do it? What moved him? 
is love. That's the answer. You want to get an idea of the love of Christ? Think about its height. Think about that stoop. Think about what it meant to him to come into this world. You know, the psalmists knew about the height of God's love. Three very quick verses, Psalm 36, 5. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Psalm 57, verse 10. Your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. Psalm 108, verse 4. Your loving kindness is great above the heavens and your truth reaches to the skies. The height of Christ's love. Let's think now about its length. How long is the love of Christ? Well, think first of all of length in terms of duration. When did the love of Christ for you, his child, when did that begin? It didn't have a beginning, did it? It's always been in his heart to love you and to save you. And when's it going to end? It can't have an ending. Any more than he, the eternal Son of God, can have an ending. It is an everlasting love fixed on those he came to save. But there's another way in which we can think about length as well. That it's the lengths to which he went so that he could secure your salvation and my salvation. His determination and quite simply, there were no lengths to which he wouldn't go to rescue you from sin. He gave up possessions. He had none of those things in this world. He had no money except what his followers gave. No clothes except what was on his back. He had no home to call his own. None of those things because those didn't matter. Those would be a snare. But he had a journey to complete. He had a purpose to accomplish. And there was nothing, absolutely nothing that would turn him aside. I don't know if you've looked through the Gospels and seen this and strung this all together. His enemies tried to turn him aside. The temptations that Satan came to through his life were many and varied, but not a few of them focused on this one thing. You don't have to go to the cross. Look, see all the kingdoms of the world. You want a reward? You want to be lord over these, those things? Just bow down and worship me and I'll give them to you. You don't need to go to the cross to get that. And then he declares his identity. Peter recognizes him and then he says, but I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be killed. And Peter says, never Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me Satan, because you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Satan was working through Peter and the aim was to deflect Jesus from the cross. Not surprising, is it? But all the way through his life, there were obstacles and there were forces and there were temptations. What do you think happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? Don't you think the temptation there was full on? Don't go through with this. You don't need to do this. And when his disciples drew a sword, you know, they had two swords against the Roman Empire. You've got to admire their courage. And when Jesus says that's enough, he's not saying, oh yeah, fine, we, we should be able to take down the Roman Empire with a couple of swords. He's saying, that's not what my kingdom is about. Well, they, they, they take out the sword, don't they? Matthew 26, verse 52, to try and prevent Jesus' arrest. And what does he say to them? Put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then 
Will the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? He wasn't going to allow his disciples to get in the way. He had to go to the cross. He wasn't going to be deflected. Set his face like a flint. Why was he so single-minded? Why were his disciples amazed as they saw him set his face to Jerusalem and press on and just sweep on one side and the other everyone and everything that would get in the way? Why was he determined to go to the cross? Because of his love. Because of his love for those he was coming to save. Let's look at the depth of Christ's love. And this happens surely at the culmination of it all. We've been looking at the things that led up to the cross. Let's look at the cross itself. Here we see the depth of Christ's love. That moment when the sky turns dark and the sun won't give its light and the father turns away from his own son who is now repulsive to him because of the sin that has been laid upon him not his own sin yours and mine if we're his children and Jesus was forsaken Disciples had all run away. Some of the faithful and courageous women standing around the throne, most of them had run away. Now his father deserts him too. And he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as he bears that weight of sin, he goes down and down into a very hell of suffering for a countless multitude of sinners suffering in his soul in a way that we can't begin to imagine and then he breathes his last and he dismisses his spirit to the father his body broken His blood shed, his life poured out. Surely it is here, more than anywhere else, that the love of Christ is dazzling in its brilliance. Have you ever wondered what the angels watching, the ones who had sung about peace on earth and and glory to God at his birth, You ever wondered what happened as the angels watched the eternal Son of God dying on a cross? In my imagination, it was very quiet in heaven. I'm not sure that one could talk of unbelief, but how did the angels get their minds around what they saw being played out in in front of them. And then Jesus breathes his last. Was there some kind of collective gasp from the angels? (gasps) Did, Did they say, see how he loved them? These people whose sins he just bore, in whose place, He just died. Remember when he wept outside the tomb of Lazarus, the people round about looked on and said, see how he loved him. Well, maybe the angels said something similar here, but here he's not weeping over the death of one sinner and the ruination that sin has brought into his very good creation. He is dead dying the death of countless sinners in their place. And he's undoing that work of ruination that Satan 
brought into his very good creation. And why did he do that? Why did he lay down his life on the cross? What moved him? Except his love. And we get our very best idea of the depth of his love on the cross. What about the breadth? The breadth of the love of Christ. Well, Christ's love is whoever love. You know the verse, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Why? That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but perish, but have eternal life. It's whoever love. It's love that came to seek and to save the lost, to redeem them at the cost of his life, to open the way to God. The curtain torn shows that very graphically. And now everyone is invited to come and to have the benefit of all that his love achieved on the cross. And the invitation is written all the way through the scriptures. It's here in the verse we've just looked at. You will know other verses. Isaiah 55, come, you who are thirsty. Jesus, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And right up to the very last verses of the Bible, I think this verse in Revelation 22, verse 17, is five verses from the end of, of the inspired revelation of God. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. This is love so broad that there is no one Jesus is unwilling to save. He has paid the price so that whosoever will may come. It's whoever love. It's love that was willing to be called a glutton and a drunkard if he might save some. It's love that reached out and touched a leper to make him clean. It's love that saved prostitutes and was happy even to have them touch him in their love for him. It's love that reached out to a man who was too fond of his own money to leave it behind and come to Jesus. Love that set free those who were held captive to demons. Love that wept over a Jerusalem whose hearts were hard and notwithstanding all his love and all his appeals to them through the prophets, they would not come in order to be loved by this God. Love that prayed for those who nailed him to the cross. Love that reaches the outcasts of the world, the scum, the refuse. Love that saves vile sinners, Saul of Tarsus. No less likely candidate for the love of Christ than him. And look what Christ did in his life. John Newton, to have a, a more recent example. His arms stretch out wide, and the invitation is still there. He didn't die on the cross in order to be meager and stingy with salvation. He died to make it available to all who will come. That means you, if you haven't come yet. He will receive you now. The fact that he descended and endured all that he did shows that many must be saved. It can't be otherwise. He can't have gone through all of that to save half a dozen, can he? That wouldn't make any sense at all. It must be a vast multitude and no one is disqualified. Look at the list of characters that he interacted with here on earth. No one is disqualified. That's the breadth of his love. And it's available to us. 
So those are the dimensions of Christ's love. Very briefly, it's a love that surpasses knowledge. That's where we began, isn't it? Well, we've now surveyed what may be known of, of, of the love, what may be perceived and, and researched and uh, discovered and learned about the dimensions of Christ's love in relation to the cross. And what do we know? Paul is telling us about the love of Christ. It goes way beyond that. Way beyond that. We haven't scratched the surface. That was the tip of an iceberg, what we've just looked at, in terms of the love of Christ. Like God himself, the love of Christ is infinite, limitless. As Job, one of Job's counselors, they did say some things that were right. And in Job 11, verse 7, I think it's Zophar, says this, Can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? They are as high as the heavens. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. And just as we start to think we're getting a grasp on it, a whole new view of it opens up. And we go through that and maybe think, getting to the end of it again, <laughs> another new view opens up and it seizes our hearts and it enraptures us and delights us and thrills us and it will through all eternity. So lastly, and this is the amazing thing, Christ's infinite love that we've looked at, that goes way beyond the things we've looked at, is something we may experience here and now as children of God. That's what he prays for in Ephesians. Remember he says that we may comprehend the dimensions of Christ's love, its length, its breadth, its height, its depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And that first know, the know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, is a, is a knowledge of experience, not a knowledge of academic performance. We can experience this love that goes beyond what may be known by human capacity, by our minds and by our research and so on and so forth. That is possible. That is an experience that is open to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more progress we make in knowing that love that surpasses knowledge, the more, Paul says, we will be filled up to all the fullness of God. And if we're filled up to all the fullness of God, that love is just going to flow from us, isn't it? Because he's not going to hold back. He's not, <laughs> that's not how God is. He's not going to say, oh, that person's full now. Not, better not send any more his way or her way. He's going to keep pouring. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 23, isn't it? My cup's running over. Look, look at the mess. Grace upon grace. Love upon love for the children of God. Can this be possible? Can this be what Paul is talking about? How can finite creatures experience infinite love? Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. It is possible. That's why Paul is praying. I don't think Paul wasted his time praying for stuff that didn't make sense and that wasn't possible. And that's what he's praying for the Ephesians. So, brothers and sisters at Grace Church in Modesto, don't be content with just an academic knowledge. Don't be content and stop when you can list out the three words in the Greek that talk about love and the differences between them and certain passages in the scripture where they are contrasted and compared and then say, well, there it is, that's love and I can move on to something else. You've not started. Don't deal with the love of Christ like that. This is love we're supposed to know by experience. So will you join me then 
as a fellowship in making this our very special prayer for us in this uh, month of March going on into April as we come up to the Easter weekend. Let's pray for ourselves that we may comprehend the dimensions of the love of Christ and that we may know by experience this love that surpasses mere knowledge and that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God as it is certainly possible for us to be. Let's pray that those who are cold may be melted. Let's pray that those whose profession is little more than skin deep may be pierced and have love flowing out of them. Let's pray for those who are backslidden to be brought back to the Savior by the power of his love. Those who are weary and worn and sad and discouraged and despondent and unexpectant Let's pray that a glimpse of this love may fire us up. It should do, shouldn't it? That we may all wonder and rejoice that his love for us is everlasting love and it is so staggering that we may know it. Now we're going to come to the table. There's no better place uh, to end this sermon than at the table. But what I would like to do, first of all, is just to spend a few moments in quietness and think about the things that we've been hearing from the Lord this morning. And then there is a hymn that we don't know the tune to at the moment. I hope we will do one day. But I would like us to see it on the screen as a further underscoring to, to what we've been looking at and as a preparation for us to come to the table. So, uh, and we'll read the words of that hymn together. Since we can't sing it together, We'll read it together, but let's just spend a few moments in quietness and, uh, and ask for the Lord to help us understand this love that is surpassing all knowledge.